Funding for this CyberWire podcast is made possible in part by LastPass. LastPass is an award-winning security solution that helps millions of individuals in over 70,000 organizations navigate their online lives easily and securely. Businesses can maximize productivity while still maintaining effortless, strong security with LastPass. LastPass can minimize risk and give your IT team a breakthrough integrated single sign-on, password management, and multi-factor authentication solution. Slothful media is the new rat in town. Emotet spam counts on political commitments. ESET describes two distinct spyware campaigns in the Middle East and Eastern Europe. Hackers are paying more attention than usual to the maritime sector. Awais Rashid from the University of Bristol on privacy concerns of contact tracing apps. Our guest is Crystal Portocarrero from Juniper Networks on the continued rise of encryption and the technical and privacy challenges that come with it. And the U.S. Treasury Department cautions all that paying up in a ransomware attack might land you in sanctions hot water. From the CyberWire studios at Data Tribe, I'm Dave Bittner with your CyberWire summary for Friday, October 2nd, 2020. U.S. Cyber Command yesterday warned that a new implant, Slothful Media, a remote access Trojan, has been detected in attacks against targets in India, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Malaysia, Russia, and Ukraine. Details are up on Cyber Command's virus total page. The U.S. Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, which cooperated with Cyber Command in developing the alert, describes Slothful Media as an information stealer, There's been no public attribution other than to say the attacks are the work of a sophisticated cyber actor. CISA and U.S. Cyber Command have in recent months been most ready to expose hacking directly by nation states. Election-themed spam represents itself as mobilizing adherents of the U.S. Democratic Party, but it's really just infecting their devices with emotet, Proofpoint says. The campaign, whose motivation seems criminal and not political, surged yesterday. The email's body text is simply copied from a page of the Democratic National Committee's site. The lures in the subject line are in the customary Act Now style, intended to inspire a sense of urgency and override skepticism and better judgment. Team Blue Take Action is the most common subject line, but some of the related subjects are detailed information and volunteer. Three others are list of works, information, and volunteer, which are just sad. It makes it seem like the hoods just aren't even trying. Gotta get a call-to-action zinger in there, kids. The last one Proofpoint mentions is Volunteers 2020, and that's V-A-L-A-N-T-E-R-S, which we think means volunteers, so add a seek as the smug editors write, or learn to spell, kids, as we say around the shop. The baited attachments that carry the malicious payload have similar names. A note for international listeners who may be baffled by the idiosyncratic American political color palette. Blue, in American political slang, denotes the Democratic Party, that is, the left or center-left. Red, in a reversal of the usage that would be common in most of the rest of the world, means the Republican Party, that is, the right or center-right. So, to be on Team Blue means, broadly speaking, to be on the progressive side of the issues. But in the case of this spam wave, while it's fishing for Democrats, they're just targets of opportunity, and the goal is traditionally criminal. The emotet spammers are crooks of the ordinary kind. Tomorrow, it could just as easily be a call to join Team Red and hop on the Trump train. Researchers at security firm ESET have identified a cyber espionage group, XDSPY, that's been active against targets in Eastern Europe since 2011. Military, diplomatic, and corporate organizations in Belarus, Moldova, Russia, Serbia, and Ukraine figure in the target list. The target list is unusual, as is the variation in sophistication the group shows. Its techniques vary from highly sophisticated operations to low-grade commodity skid work. 
ESET hasn't been able to discern any connections to other threat actors, and whoever they are, XD Spy has been in business for 11 years. ESET this week also described a new strain of Android spyware cloaked as bogus versions of legitimate services, including Android Update, Threema, and Telegram. ESET calls the group responsible APTC23. Others have called it Desert Scorpion or Two-Tailed Scorpion and linked it to Hamas. The targets currently being prospected are for the most part in the Middle East. The malware, which ESET calls Android Spy C23, is being offered in Digital Apps, a third-party store that contains a mix of benign and malicious apps. This discovery offers information on evolving tactics and techniques. The two-tailed scorpion threat actor has been on Defender's radar since the Chinese security firm Kihu 360 outed them in March of 2017. The International Maritime Organization, a UN regulatory body concerned with the shipping industry, yesterday disclosed that it had been hit with a cyber attack that significantly disrupted its IT systems. The nature of the attack isn't yet known, and it represents an administrative and business problem as opposed to a direct threat to safety of navigation. The industry publication G Captain offers some a priori speculation that the incident may have been a hacktivist protest of the grounding of the container ship MV Wakashio off Mauritius and the attendant bunker oil spill, but this really is just speculation. The motive is as unknown as the malware. But many observers have taken note that this represents the third cyber attack against a maritime sector target over the past week. First, as the Wall Street Journal notes, the French container giant CMA CGM was hit with ransomware over the weekend. And on a smaller but still irritating scale, Maritime Executive reports that the British ferry service Red Funnel, which operates between Southampton and the Isle of Wight, had suffered a cyber attack that disrupted online ticket sales. If you wanted to buy a ticket, you just have to show up at the kiosk and hand your money over in person. And finally, if you're a ransomware victim, here's another reason to refuse to pay the extortionists. Not only are they creeps, we lapse into lawyers' technical jargon here, who shouldn't be rewarded and encouraged, but you may be placing yourself on the wrong side of the law. You could find yourself in violation of sanctions. Yesterday, the U.S. Treasury Department Office of Foreign Assets Control issued a friendly reminder that companies involved in ransomware payouts risk transgressing OFAC regulations and incurring civil penalties. The notice specifically names financial institutions, cyber insurance firms, and companies involved in digital forensics and incident response. One takeaway from the Wall Street Journal's coverage, if you do pay, don't keep ransomware payments quiet. It's a bad look and it will land you in hot water. Looping in law enforcement is encouraged and it counts as good behavior in any assessment of penalties. So, all the cops. And now, a word from our sponsor, Proofpoint Insider Threat Management. In a changing work landscape that increasingly relies on technology, people are the new cybersecurity perimeter. Employees, contractors, third parties, and anyone who has access to your sensitive data and critical systems can become an insider threat. And it's on the rise. Proofpoint's leading insider threat management solution, formerly Observit, empowers security teams to identify user risk, prevent data loss, and accelerate incident response so you can protect your organization from insider risk. To find out if your organization is protected, take a free trial at observeit.com slash cyberwire. That's observeit.com slash cyberwire. And we thank Proofpoint Insider Threat Management for sponsoring our show. My guest today is Crystal Portocarrero, product manager for advanced threats from Juniper Networks. She joins us with insights on how the increased use of encryption presents challenges for both privacy and technical reasons. 
we're seeing, you know, an increase in encryption kind of across the board and anywhere from probably 70 to 90% of most internet kind of outbound connections are now being encrypted via SSL. You know, and it makes a lot of sense. Most services now, you know, everybody's kind of banking online, shopping online. So most of these services are offering, right, encryption um, to keep those things, you know, protected, which makes a lot of sense. And then also you see some of the largest providers have really started, you know, a huge push for using encryption. So, you know, Google, Microsoft, uh, Facebook um, have all started encrypting all their connections with SSL as well. And so what are some of the challenges that, that the increased use of encryption provides for folks who are securing enterprises? Well, so there's a lot of, of challenges there, right? Because most of the security tools that are available today um, all require traffic to be in the clear. So any kind of deep packet inspection, if you're talking about doing things like, you know, intrusion prevention, antivirus, right? all of these types of traffic inspection tools require the traffic to be in the clear, which, of course, as we start seeing more and more encrypted traffic, that becomes harder um, so the, the main way of dealing with it today is to proxy all those connections. And so, you know, whether you do that on a firewall, whether you do that, you know, on a separate device, um, it doesn't really matter. It's still adding a lot of overhead. Um, it's overhead not only for the device that has to proxy all those connections. So now you have, instead of one connection, it's two connections. And then there's also the overhead of managing certificates, which anybody that's ever kind of run, you know, a, a PKI, it, it's not <laughs> the most exciting uh, thing to do. Right? It's, it's just a lot to handle doing certificate revocation, um, keeping track of, you know, making sure that everything is still up to date. So there's an entire infrastructure around certificates um, that adds on, you know, quite a bit of overhead. But, you know, currently that's still the best way of dealing with it. But even that is, you know, outside of the the overhead it adds, I think, there's a lot more um, going on in the world now where people are starting to really question the, the you know, are those always necessary? Um, and wanting, you know, kind of users expecting more privacy. You see things like GDPR in, in Europe and things like uh, C CPPA in, in California, where we're looking at, well, at what points, you know, is it not acceptable to decrypt a user's traffic? And even if it's, you know, an enterprise traffic, you know, do you want to be decrypting, you know, if, if somebody's browsing, um, you know, the healthcare or their bank at work, that's, you know, fairly normal, typical activity. Um, should you be decrypting all of that? And so there's some privacy issues, I think, that it brings up. And, and then how do you kind of deal with that? I see. And where do you suppose we're headed? What does the future hold for this? Well, you know, there, I, th I don't think that you know, going back, right, and trying to do deep packet inspection and really, you know, kind of break the encryption all this traffic is, is a great idea. I think kind of where we're headed with needing, right, users wanting more privacy is generally a really good thing, which means that we have to find a different way of dealing with it. So there are certain technologies that are um, out there like SSL inference, um, that are starting to just look at the details of like the SSL handshake or the TLS handshake to figure out what's going on. You know, you can look at connection statistics and certain ways in which, you know, uh, connections might beacon out to get an idea of if they are malicious or not without having to break the decryption. Well, I, I, w I wanted to touch on that because it, it seems to me like I suppose there's an educational component here as well because I don't have the sense that a whole lot of users really have a, a good idea of exactly what happens in the pathway of their data. You know, what if I am at work and I'm doing something, I'm, I'm logging into my doctor's office or something like that. Um, it seems to me like perhaps, you know, there are assumptions that people make or uh, in either direction that either they're going to see everything or everything's going to be encrypted or somewhere in between. Do you suppose that that's part of it as well as kind of, I don't know, establishing kind of norms as to what we can and can't expect? Yeah, no, that's, that's a really good point. And, and especially what we're seeing today, you know, with more and more people working from home and having to 
you know, constantly be connected to a VPN, the work and home space, like that line is kind of blurring. Um, and so you're more likely to probably browse to these kind of things that you might wait till you do, you know, until you get home. Now you're doing it either way. And so I think there is kind of a shared responsibility, you know, to to inform your users of what's actually going on, what types of technologies you're using, where exceptions are being made, so they can make more informed decisions as well. That's Crystal Portocarrero from Juniper Networks. There's an extended version of our interview available on CyberWire Pro. Check it out on our website, thecyberwire.com. And now, a word from our sponsor, Know Before. Email is still the number one attack vector the bad guys use, with a whopping 91% of cyber attacks beginning with phishing. But email hacking is much more than phishing and launching malware. Find out how to protect your organization in an on-demand webinar by Roger A. Grimes, Know Before's data-driven defense evangelist. Roger walks you through 10 incredible ways you can be hacked by email and how to stop the bad guys. And he also shares a hacking demo by Know Before's chief hacking officer, Kevin Mitnick. So check out the 10 incredible ways where you'll learn how silent malware launch, remote password hash capture, and rogue rules work, why rogue documents, establishing fake relationships, and compromising a user's ethics are so effective, details behind clickjacking and web beacons, and how to defend against all of these. Go to knowbefore.com slash 10 ways and watch the webinar. That's K-N-O-W-B-E numeral four dot com slash numerals one and zero W-A-Y-S. And we thank Know Before for sponsoring our show. And I'm pleased to be joined once again by Professor Awais Rashid. He's a professor of cybersecurity at Bristol University. Uh, Weiss, it's great to have you back. Um, I, I wanted to touch on privacy, and uh, which to me has really come to uh, the top of mind for a lot of folks, especially as we've been going through this pandemic and we've had to deal with nations deploying contact tracing apps. And I believe uh, in, in your home in the UK, um, it sort of got off to a bit of a false start there. Yeah, so there has been a lot of debate about about contact tracing, and you 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 must have heard this this debate about centralized versus versus decentralized uh, right. uh, approaches to contact tracing, and a lot of that has uh, kind of hinged on uh, the the issues of privacy. I think the key key thing to think about is that the question here isn't as to whether one approach is necessarily uh, superior than another because developers is or organizations is ability to sort of implement them has its challenges in in itself uh, but also both approaches have their pros and cons the big question with regards to privacy comes from the fact that in the in the case of the decentralized approach there isn't a central central repository or shall we say a central database which is going to hold all that all that information and mm. and the 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 concern around the centralized approach exactly comes from that is that it's not simply from the perspective of people being concerned about the confidentiality of that data. It's it's as much about the transparency, transparency and accountability of how that data may be used and who will access that data and for what purposes. And that is really what the biggest debate here has been about in the first instance. Yeah, it's been fascinating to watch as, as different uh, areas around the globe have, have had different approaches. Um, and I suppose a big part of it is communications of... of being successful in explaining to the citizens what we're trying to do, how we're trying to do it, and uh, how how much security is a part of that. And even, I suppose, if there are certain sacrifices folks might have to make when it comes to privacy uh, for the greater good. Yeah, so I, I I think the, the communication is exactly part of the part of the issue. But I, I think part of the issue also is that there has been a lot of focus around. The discussion so over the years, privacy has become very much an issue of confidentiality. So we we talk about privacy breaches when people's personal data has been uh, you know leaked, and as a result, uh, something has happened. But privacy is actually much more than just confidentiality, and this debate about contact tracing really brings it to the fore, because mm-hmm. the question here isn't that 
you know, it's, let's take a centralized approach. People are not saying necessarily that the centralized approach is bad. The concern is how that centralized database is going to be used. And how do we actually demonstrate that if it's only going to be used for contact tracing, it won't be used for any other purpose. And if it is used for any other purpose, then how do you find out that it has been used for any other purpose. So, so that, 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 that is really at the heart, heart of this, that if you start to build centralized repositories, uh, then certainly there are, there are concerns about, for example, you know, uh, surveillance and the use of that information for purposes for which it wasn't, it wasn't collected. So, so I think whatever approach one takes, the issue about how the data is actually used and accessed and how do you actually communicate those aspects of the data to the people whose data is being held is as important as ensuring the confidentiality of that data. Yeah, it strikes me also that the folks who've been developing these apps and are, are trying to implement them, uh, they have a bit of an uphill climb because uh, certainly when it comes to things like social media, we've seen story after story of people's data being shared or uh, released in ways that they're not, not necessarily comfortable with. Yeah, absolutely. And and I think that that really, therein lies really the problem, because with all these kind of various breaches, and also when we are uh, in the space where, you know, there are sort of uh, news about uh, large scale interference with democratic processes based on data from social media, and, uh, and so on and so forth, it generally erodes trust. In, the, in 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 this in this in this kind of infrastructure and and uh, w- one of one of the key uh, challenges uh, that, that that is faced with any any such approach is that that cost benefit analysis is not particularly clear to someone actually contributing that data we we have a data economy at the moment which kind of very much works on an all or nothing nothing model you know as a user you either sign up to your, to a service you provide your data and you you know benefit from the service or you sign up to a don't sign up to a service and don't provide your data there there is no there is no halfway house there because you don't really have a lot of control as to how that data is subsequently used you don't have a lot of visibility of uh, how that data is subsequently used and can you actually say no i want it to be used for x purpose but not y purpose and now we are back to the contact tracing if you are contributing your data to a contact tracing platform, how do you actually say, well, I only want it to be used for the very purpose of contact tracing and no other purpose, and how do you ensure that it's actually not been used for any other purpose? And that, that, that is really where, where the problem lies at the heart of it. There is, of course, quite a lot of work that has been done in the, in the space of uh, what is known as privacy-enhancing technologies about ways to share data without revealing information about uh, the, uh, the particular details about the uh, individuals to whom that data belongs. But, uh, you know, a lot more work needs to be done in that space to, to make sure how do we actually share this kind of information on a massive scale, for example, in the case of a crisis or a pandemic, without actually impinging on uh, privacy and civil liberties. Yeah. All right. Well, Professor Awais Rashid, thanks for joining us. Thanks to all of our sponsors for making the CyberWire possible, especially our supporting sponsor, Proofpoints Observe It, the leading people-centric insider threat management solution. Learn more at observeit.com. And that's the CyberWire. For links to all of today's stories, check out our daily briefing at thecyberwire.com. And for professionals and cybersecurity leaders who want to stay abreast of this rapidly evolving field, sign up for CyberWire Pro. It'll save you time, keep you informed, and it's finger licking good. Listen for us on your Alexa smart speaker, too. Be sure to check out this weekend's Research Saturday and my conversation with Joachim Kennedy and Rory Gold from Anomaly. We'll be discussing the smog ransomware as a service. That's Research Saturday. Don't miss it. The CyberWire podcast is proudly produced in Maryland out of the startup studios of Data Tribe, where they're co-building the next generation of cybersecurity teams and technologies. Our amazing CyberWire team is Elliot Peltzman, Peru Prakash, Stefan Vaziri, Kelsey Bond, Tim Nodar, Joe Kerrigan, Carol Terrio, Ben Yellen, Nick Vilecki, Gina Johnson, Bennett Moe, Chris Russell, John Petrick, Jennifer Iben, Rick Howard, Peter Kilpie, and I'm Dave Bittner. 
Thanks for listening. We'll see you back here next week. It's time to take a moment to tell you about our sponsor, Tanium. Today, we rely on endpoints for everything from remote work to mobile banking, telemedicine, and online learning. That's why managing and securing these endpoints has never been more important. Tanium provides unified endpoint management and security built for the world's most demanding IT environments, providing instant visibility, complete context, and rapid response. That's why all six branches of the U.S. Armed Forces and half of the Fortune 100 trust Tanium to protect their IT operations. Join Tanium at this year's Converge 2020 virtual event to learn about the latest advances in unified endpoint management and security, connect with industry peers, and hear directly from other leading technology partners like Google Cloud and Salesforce. Go to converge.tanium.com and enter promo code CYBERWIRE to receive a 15% discount on a lab pass. And we thank Tanium for sponsoring our show.